you know, little, you know, nudge, elbow, elbow kind of thing, and the whole, you know, pound fist uh, emoji and stuff like that. <laughs> and, you know, maybe, maybe he'll realize uh, what kind of talent you are. So tell everybody where you're from, what you're doing now, and how did you land up in Los Angeles? Wow. Well, I'm from Vancouver. I grew up in a teeny weeny little town about an hour and a half north of Vancouver. It wasn't even a town, actually. It was 200 people. We had no running water, no paved roads, a little red schoolhouse, grades one through six in the same classroom. <laughs> and um, uh, animals, you know, bears and everything in the backyard, which now has me loving animals. But uh, eventually moved to Vancouver and then I got a really bad car accident, which made me think twice about what I wanted to do with my life. And eventually I got into the entertainment industry, which is what I'd always wanted to do. And I just started to, you know, do what I could. I did a standing work and extra work and ended up getting on uh, some radio gigs. And I just, just really pushed it and finally got some TV work. And then um, I ended up going to Toronto just sort of to, to check it out and stayed there for four years, worked on the Howard Stern show as the, Canadian segment host there for the Howard Stern show and did a TV morning show. Um, and then I decided to come to the States. Very hard to do, but I got in, in market number four in Philadelphia at the NBC affiliate, which hardly ever happens. Usually you have to start off in a small market somewhere, but they got a hold of my tape and da 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 da. So the next thing you know, I've got my two cats and myself driving my li little in Canada we call Celica Celicas. So I know it's weird, but there's it's even advertising and everything. They're Celicas, not Celicas. So anyways, I'm driving across from, from, I went across the border of Vancouver over through into Seattle. And from there, I drove all the way to Philadelphia. Me, my two cats in my Celica, got to the NBC affiliate there and absolutely hated it. They had stung me <laughs> money-wise. Um, I, they have me doing a split shift. So I was doing the news and traffic break, uh, traffic and breaking news in the morning show, but they didn't tell me that I was, that was also supposed to come back and then do the afternoon drive, do the six uh, o'clock news and every, all for the same price. Oh. Uh, they neglected to mention that to me. So I was pissed and I didn't, I hated it there. Nothing against Philly, but I just, I just, oh my. And so anyways, I begged them to release me. I'd signed contracts. I got a lease on an apartment. Finally, they sent me to Chicago, and I was like, oh, thank God, Chicago. It's the best city. I love Chicago. But at the same time, the Weather Channel had been sort of looking at my tapes and talking to my agent. So I was only in Chicago for about four months, and then I went to the Weather Channel. I was at the Fox affiliate in the helicopter in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the Weather Channel, stayed there for, I guess, about three years, just traveling the country doing a show called Road Crew, and um, so I've been to every single state every single state in the united states of america which i'm quite proud of being that i'm a little canadian girl and then eventually i ended up getting to la which is what i had always wanted to do because i've also acted throughout this entire all of the stuff i just mentioned i also acted so finally got to la about i guess eight years ago and now that's where i sit <laughs> you've probably done more tra you obviously have done more traveling than i have and i was born and raised in uh, Southern California, but I've, you know, I've, I've, I've been to Philly or Philadelphia it's because I'm not from Philly. I can't see Philly. I've been to Philadelphia. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been to Pittsburgh. I've been to Tampa Bay, Florida. I've been to uh, Washington or as they say there, Washington, uh, Washington. State. Yeah. Washington. I, I like to get my Washington in Washington. No, I'm not taking that. <laughs> Love everybody around the country. So don't, don't, don't get that twisted. Let me just put that out there. Um, right. So, so coming from from Canada, I guarantee you, and of course, I'm not going to speak for you. You can do that yourself. That's why you're on the Rude Dog Show. Um, <laughs> I will let everybody speak their own mind, say what they have to say. <laughs> but coming from Canada, I mean, how much of a culture shock? You said you didn't like Philadelphia, but what was it about not liking Philadelphia? I mean, I understand the work was grueling, and you know, you have to crawl before you can walk. But what was it about Philadelphia you just did not like? Was it the food? Were you tired of the cheesesteaks? I mean. <laughs> What, what, did, 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 did you find some bad meat? I mean, what was it about Philadelphia that just made you want to cringe, roll up into a little ball and somehow find yourself out of there? Well, in, in, the, in defense of Philly, it probably wasn't Philadelphia. Like, I got there, I left, I officially entered the country. Like, you know, when you get a working visa, you have to do an official thing where I am now leaving Canada and entering the U.S. You have to sort of do an official stamp thing. 
And so I, it was January 2nd. So it was right in the middle of winter. So I drove all the way there, like I said, my two cats and me, and um, got to Philly. And it was like literally three feet of snow. Now I had lived in Toronto for four years, so I was used to the snow, but it was, it, it was more the job. They didn't want me, the girl that had been, I, I was doing traffic for in a separate, they had it separated. And so the girl that was there before me was Lebanese or something that I'm like total pale white girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> and, she, and she was like completely dark and they didn't want to change the lighting. So they wanted me to wear dark makeup. And it, I mean, it's as ridiculous as that sounds, it, so I had to have it all over on my hands and everywhere I had to be covered in makeup because they didn't want to uh, pay money for different lighting. And so, and then they had me hardwired. So my microphone, I had wires dangling down and they were caught in the chairs. And sometimes I'd have to be standing up doing my reports with the chair stuck to my butt because we couldn't get me out of the chair in time to go, to go live. And I'm not even kidding. This is NBC in Philadelphia. It's not like it's in the middle of nowhere. We're talking about a major market, you know? And so it wasn't so much Philadelphia. I have to be completely honest, I guess. It was really more the job. Right. You know, sometimes the jobs that we have, uh, and, and I've been doing radio for, for four years, started from basically nothing. So, you know, I've, I, I've been through the grueling hours of, of writing and, and acquiring talent, such as yourself and lots of other fantastic uh, people to join me here on the Rudolph show. But um, I, I can see where having not such a good seed is bad, but I mean, were you whiter than everybody else because you were from an area where there was more <laughs> snow around the year than anything <laughs> Yes, exactly. The rain uh, from Vancouver, uh, you know, the sun doesn't shine too much in Vancouver. <laughs> That's the old joke. The sun doesn't sh shine much there, but when it does, it makes you forget about all the rain. That's the joke about Vancouver because it is absolutely beautiful in this, you know, in the spring and summer. Right. But I don't know what their deal was. I really don't. I just, I, I literally went in to the boss and this is, I'm not even exaggerating. I walked into the office one day and I got on my hands and my knees and I begged him to let me out of my contract and to please send me to anywhere. I told him I would go to Green Bay anywhere. Why, to get there me was out snow? <laughs> yeah, somehow I was used to the snow. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're used to the snow, then I guess that, that, that would be okay. Yeah, so, exactly. So, so, so not only now you've already experienced the U.S. customary, and I was going to say, when you left Canada, did you have mm -hmm. to denounce Canada, or was it just, I'm from Canada, but I want to be in America? I mean, was there like a verbal thing you had to go through, some type of mock setup with lighting or on video, or was it just, <laughs> was there anything like that? So what happens is like um, it depends what kind. Of, I now have a green card, um, so I'm not an actual citizen. I still can't vote here, even though if I could, even though I complain about Trump on a regular basis, everyone tells me to shut up because you can't vote anyway. But um, <laughs> people on like, Facebook always tell me, "Look, if you hate it so much, go back to Canada." But um, the thing is, is when you just like I had a visa to go to the NBC affiliate so that it's job specific. Right. So you have, you, you cross over, but it's just that on your passport, like because you actually are making an official transition, mm -hmm. there has to be sort of an official thing where it's like stamped, entered the country as such and such. So it's not announced in Canada as much. You do that when you become a citizen, okay. even when you have a green card. You're still, like when, when you just have a visa, it's job specific. So every time you have jobs, you have to change your, your working visa. But when you get your green card, then you, you can work anywhere and do anything, but you can't vote. Oh, well, I'm, yeah. I'm sure you probably wanted to vote a couple thousand times uh, to make, <laughs> hopefully make some type of change. But I don't – look, I, I'm from here. I don't, I don't even vote. I, I just don't – I have no – yeah, I, I'm, I'm good. And that's about as political as I get. Pol politics equals no vote. I'm just saying, you know. Right. People yeah, may throw well, out the – the hate card, it's, but it's just not something I do. Well, I think only 44% of eligible voters. Also, too, I should remember, I don't know if I mentioned, but I'm also, I'm a reporter. Oh, you know, and I'm because of the sports angle. I was the MC for the Toronto Blue Jays in uh, Toronto. I also was the MC for the Toronto uh, Rock, the lacrosse team, which was a four t four year champions in a row. Those are the four years I was their MC. I, I take credit for their uh, 
world championship. You can have all the credit <laughs> you want there. <laughs> <laughs> and also the Toronto Argonauts. I was their MC for many, many years. Yeah, yeah. There are so. a couple players um, that have gone through the Rude Dog Show every now and again uh, who play for Toronto and the Argonauts awesome. a lot more specifically. So, but I mean, how was that? Did they ask a lot of you when you were emceeing? Was it just an announcing thing? Was it halftime? Did they ask you to do the, the, the national anthem in Canada? I mean, was there <laughs> no. something? I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if you want to sing or not. I'm just saying that did they, did, they, did they ask you? Trust me, you don't want me to sing. Trust me on that one. Oh, no, go ahead. No. Oh, Canada. <laughs> That's about as much as I'm willing to That's do. That's it? And That's the hockey games, you're, and I love it. Everyone says to me, oh, I know the Canadian anthem. And it's like, I'm all impressed. Really? They go, yeah, they, they play it at the hockey games. Like, of course they do. <laughs> well, well, not only that, but, but one of my favorite bands is from Canada, and that's Rush. Uh, they, awesome. They, they help put Canada on the map, eh? Uh, hey. And, I, and I, I think I used that properly. So – uh, if I didn't, it's too late. It's already recorded. No, but, but <laughs> so, so you, you've done a lot of work. You've had some several independent film uh, shots. You've been uh, seen on Jimmy Kimmel. I watched that video clip. And if anybody has not gone to her website at uh, KelseyKinsley.com, it's actually pretty cool. I was looking at it and I seen it's purple font or mauve or something. And then the background is very well distorted. Uh, and, and, um, you know, so you have video reels there and so on and so forth. So I sent those, that, that real page that you have to, mm -hmm. to that exec. So hopefully oh, you'll be able to check it out easily contact. You. I'm sure your content information is on there. Go to KelseyKinsley.com. Go check it out. She's, she's done a lot of things. I, and I see where you're chasing down Dan Aykroyd. How did that go? And Oh, yeah. But uh, let me mention there's no Ian Kinsley because everybody will go Kelsey Kinsley. They'll put an E in there and oh. you won't find it. So just mention no Ian Kinsley. Right. Uh, that was hilarious. That was on the Howard Stern show. And oh, my God, if you don't watch anything else on that site, watch that. I personally, if you watch that clip, watch it and then watch it again. But the guy standing beside him is his dad. And so, you know, I'm saying I'm talking about Dan Aykroyd's. This is something I did on the Stern Show, you know, those ambush reports, you yeah. know, where you went out. And, so um, <laughs> it, I'm talking about Dan Aykroyd's rather large penis. A rumor would have it. I've not seen it. But the rumor is he's got a uh, big one. So, uh, you know, he's there doing this whole thing about how he donated all of these computers to the Canadian Institute of the Blind. And it was like this massive press thing. And I'm standing up there. So is it true you have a big penis? And um, if you, and, you know, they call security and everything. But the, if you watch the dad, the dad is all like, that's my boy. <laughs> oh, like, wow. So, yeah, that's so just weird. not something I want to be ambushed on and, and <laughs> asked about. I, I, I probably right? would just walk away or get really, really shy and, and kind of, uh, you know, hush it. But anyway, so, <laughs> so I guarantee you he was walking away running as fast as he can the other direction. Um, well, he, he basically threw me out. Called to, he tried to call security. Then he realized there was no security. So then he had to throw me out himself. And he, he, he did. turned into his own security. I know, right? But the, <laughs> I swear to God, the funniest part on that, on that clip is to just watch his dad. When the question comes out, is it true? Something, ask something about your big penis. If you look at his dad, his dad is just proud. It's so funny. Uh, I seen it. I was, I, I said, oh, no. Oh, no. Not. <laughs> Not for me. It's not a no. Uh, I'm good. So okay. So so here you are. You're 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 on Howard Stern. You've done your interviews. How did that transition into the Weather Channel? Because well, usually it's not a forecast about penises. It's it's a it's it, it's a it's a forecast of weather. How that's going to affect your commute. Uh, how, how did that go? I mean, was it just something that you wanted to do? Was it just an opportunity came your direction? How did that come about? I know everybody's like, how did you go from the Howard Stern show to the weather channel? It's like from A to in Canada, we it's Z. You guys say Z, but it's A to Z in Canada. That's it. There's all these little teeny weeny differences. Like we look the same. And for the most part, we sound the same. But there's a few little things that I say. People go, what? And then they go, where are you like from? Salika. <laughs> Salika, Zed, what else? We never use the word trash, unless it's white trash. Like trash, we that's a that's an American term. Garbage, you know, garbage. Yeah. Trash is 
Yeah. There's all kinds of little, little things. And garburators, you know, your tra- the thing, the disposal in your sink? They're what? They're called what? The, you know, the little disposal yeah. in your sink? Yeah, they're what called garbage guys- disposals. Garbage disposal. Well, in Canada, we call them garburators. That one took me a long time. <laughs> it's like, I would go, I'd call my landlord, I'd be like, can you come and fix my garburator? They'd be like, we, we don't have that. Wow, <laughs> I, a garburator. <laughs> There's all these little, oh, you'll love this one too. In Canada, it, the stripper laws are much more lenient and lax than they are down here. So up in there, the strippers, they will, there's two girls together often and they go into a shower and they like shower each other. So it this kind of became this tack call where like, I used to do all the MC because of the radio, you know, go out and say, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it sort of became like a tack call that they would, the people up there would go shower, shower. It's just like going, oh my God. hey, you, hey, or yeah, yeah, or whatever. It's, yeah. it's a, very common up there. Oh boy. So a couple of times like down here, when I first got here, somebody would do something that was fun or whatever. And I'd go shower, shower. Like, what? So people need a shower. <laughs> need a shower to wash themselves <laughs> off. So, so, so I learned very, very quickly that that doesn't that go over well here. Uh, back to your question. Usually um, not, they, but you did answer it. Yes. <laughs> well, they just when they just went back, they just got a hold of my tape. Is really what happened with the Weather Channel? Okay. That's really just the truth of it. They got, uh, they got a hold of my my tape from a TV morning show that I had done mm-hmm. in uh, Canada, and then they had been looking for a sort of non-traditional, non-meteorologist, non-scientist host, and they got a hold of my tape, and that's really how that came about. I mean, I literally got a call. Right, and and to add. St- Add an interesting fact to this is, is that you're the only person at the Weather Channel that did not have a a degree in science or meteorology. And, and and I know, I mean, I'm not dying to get onto the Weather Channel. And clearly, ex NFL players like Heinz Ward has been mm-hmm. on on the Weather Channel. Did you have a chance to meet Heinz Ward at all at any point? I didn't. Um, I was like. The, uh, the road room reporter. I traveled five out of seven days for almost four years straight. So yeah. I was not really even in the studio a lot. So I was sort of out there doing like, we called it the fun weather. I didn't do any severe weather. I was never in tornadoes. I was always at events, you know, uh, tailgating football, college football or mm. concerts or just all that kind of stuff, you know, uh, the Kentucky Derby, all of these type of things. So I didn't really, I mean, I knew, I met most of the hosts there, you know, Jim Cantori and all of those people, but um, I I really wasn't in the studio much. Okay. Well, that's fair. Sometimes going to the studio, I got to travel and then I got to go. And then when I get done, I got to go back. Sometimes just staying out of that area. If you could do it remotely, then you're good. Yeah, they just well, said totally, and... totally. And the other thing was because I really was, I was the, and to this day, I'm the only person who was on air at the Weather Channel that wasn't a scientist or a meteorologist. And while for the most part, everybody treated me kindly, sometimes, you know, they'd look at me like, oh, there's that, uh, you know, actress who's on, you know, I kind of got a little bit of that sometimes. What is she doing here? Why is she at the Weather Channel? So, <laughs> it, I mean, for the, like, seriously, for the most part, everyone was great. But there was a little bit of that, you know. Right. I didn't know anything about weather. Right. They almost, the almost frowned on you and say, how dare you be here? You I don't know whether – you don't know whether yeah. like I do. You don't know whether or not I'll be here next year. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, let's kind of backlog here because, well, I don't know. You, you've, been, you've been a lot of places. When I say a lot of places, I mean – in the movie industry, and more so importantly, you're working as a prosecutor in a movie called I Am Fear. How is that yes. working out for you, and is that being filmed here in Los Angeles? Yes, they actually just completed it. It's a horror movie, and it. I actually was – I did the short – they did a short um, called Sarah's – I mean, uh, Samir uh, – The Eyes of Samir. And then I, so I was the actual star of the short with Tony Todd, who's the Candyman. I don't know if anyone remembers, but he's like a major class, a classic horror show. I, I remember. Yeah, yeah. He's like a, an I'm icon. One of those. Yeah. So um, it was, and so I got to be, I did that. And then they raised money from that to do the, to do the feature. And then with the feature, of course, they went with somebody who's much more known than me, some big, you know, scream queen, scream queen. But because I had done the pilot, they, they gave me a part in the 
in the well, there you go. future as well. Cool. Yeah. Well, so, hey, you know what? You, it, it's something, right? Yeah. It's always something because you never know when that's going to lead you to, to something else. Well, it's also to form, you know, forming relationships. Like, so I'm friends now with the director. So that's, you know, so it's all good. It's all good. Everything always comes back to, you know, who you worked with, who you know, especially you, I mean, in this, in the business you're in, you know that it's like, it's the relationships are almost everything. Yes. Yes, they are. It's all about networking. Matter of fact, I had the last, well, the last three connection requests that I gave out, I'm on LinkedIn as well, because I'm always, you know, you you never know. You never know. But the last three people work for the New York Knicks. So, uh, in, in the upper office and so on and so forth. So, and I've never been to New York ever. Yes. Really? Yeah, I know. Shocking. I, I, I can tell just by your wow. reply was, ah, I can't believe you've <laughs> never been to New York. So no, I'm trying to get there. Maybe at some point I'll stop in and say, hello. I have friends up there. Uh, you know, shout out to a couple people, uh, Sanders who lives out there, buddy of mine, but, there are other movies that, that, that you played as well. And so yeah. Tainted Rose, I don't even want to go into Camp Virginovich. That, that, that obviously speaks for itself. Uh, <laughs> the, that was actually pretty the, funny. <laughs> yeah, I bet it is. The talent, um, Eggnog. I like Eggnog. Um, but it was a movie, 2010, Nine of Redemption, which also sounds like a horror movie. Um, yes. Also, uh, not, we're not going to down the low-budget movies because sometimes – those are some of the best. It's kind of like a bar, right? A little dive bar. So you don't yeah. know what it's like until you get in there. Other restaurants or other places like BJ's or what have you are bigger. They're more brand yeah. new. Everybody knows who they are. But a dive bar sometimes has some of the best environment and beer and all that good stuff. And, of course, all they have is bar food, uh, mm-hmm. which you probably already had the, the, the privy of checking out. But more, more importantly, it's not about the – looks on the outside it's what's on the inside so even though the budgets for some of these movies haven't been very big you've had a chance to appear in some of them which is very interesting what are your thoughts about these some of these low budget movies and do you think that they've kind of helped enhance your career to get somebody to look at the reel and say oh a gem well see that's the thing you just nailed it you're very observant and intuitive because the secret is getting tape you need to have a reel so if you're not willing to work on some smaller productions, if you're not getting, you know, getting caught my agent right now, uh, between the eyes, not the best. And so I'm <laughs> not really, <laughs> I'm not really getting out for the nice, big, juicy stuff. So why not work on the smaller stuff? That way you get real, you get, because your reel is the most important thing right now. Yeah. Back in the day, it was your eight by 10. Now yeah. it's like what's online. It's what they can see. Right. So the best way to get tape is an old word, but the best way to get it is, to do stuff that is smaller. I mean, because some of this stuff, you know, is still great stuff. It's just a low budget, that's all. Well, you know, it, it's it, it's not it's it's not the size that matters. It's what's a part. <laughs> what it, it's a part of the I'm not taking that from Howard Stern. Sorry. I I, I don't do <laughs> I don't do Howard Stern. But um, you know, when it comes to movie, big budget movies have you know the bigger name stars the bigger better writers and so on and so forth but in some cases again not to harp on this but sometimes the smaller movies can be some of the better ones so i encourage everybody to go check out things like love talk and dream state rules all movies that you've starred in you have your own individual part may not be a massive one but i think the largest one uh in regards to what, what you've done so far and i think the biggest is driving bill crazy in 2008 that had a pretty decent was, that was half a million well no quarter million so we, we, okay look i understand some people are crazy i get it some people don't really have to act crazy to actually be crazy but what is it about being a patient in the movie that was designated to be crazy i mean was that something that came naturally to you or- <laughs> yes of course i've done lots of crazy stuff. i did this part in a film called zachariah farted and it's it, that t- particular clip has got so many hits on YouTube because I'm just like this mad, crazy woman. And I swear, like you have never heard a woman swear. Every word come out of my mouth, you words you never even put together yourself. And it's like pretty funny. So, and I got, I did, did all, all the driving too. So I'm like sliding into these people and, and it was great because I got to do all the old, the, I didn't want somebody else, you know, doing the stunts, which is another thing. I've done the stunts. Um, a lot of the, the own, my own stunt stuff as well, which is um, very fun. I love it. Well, did, did you didn't hurt yourself, did you? 
no, in any of no, her stunts? No, 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 oh, okay. no okay. but in, in um, the horror that we were talking about earlier, at the time it was called Eyes of Samir. The feature now is called I Am Fear, uh -huh. uh, but the short was called um, Eyes of Samir. And there's all kinds of crazy stunts in there. I mean, they cut my head off and I come back as a demon and kill everybody. And I, all of those stunts I did myself, flying through the air. And it was amazing and fun. Well, good thing I stay away from those types of movies. Um, <laughs> not because you're in them, but because I don't do horror movies. It's just not oh, my okay. thing. I think the last one I've seen was the original Saw movie. Oh, and, okay, yeah. and I'm done. Uh, after that, I said, I'm done. Setting up trash for people to kill them slowly is not my I idea know. of a good time. So, did, you uh, see, did you see the last house on the left? Um, I heard of that movie. There was, um, uh, there was, gosh, I actually have some of them. I don't even watch them. They just kind of sit there and collect dust in my case, but, uh, the house in the hills, one of them. Um, yes, that's pretty good too. But the last no. house on the left, you, you should watch it cause it is horror, but it's not like, it's more psychological thriller, but it's classified as a horror, but and it's a remake from the seven a seventies movie. But it's got the guy from uh, Breaking Bad in it. I can't remember his name. Oh now, but yeah, okay, yeah, it, yeah. I, I, I know what you're talking about. So good. The remake is just. It is one of the best all time classic horror movies. You must see it. And it's not too blood and gore. Like I said, it's kind of half horror, half psychological thriller. I like psychological warfare. Uh, I, I think that that's probably the, the, the most appealing aspect to any given movie, especially when right. those people own that role. They, they own their ability to be psychologically uh, incapable of making yes. a, a rash decision, which adds to the infamy of that, of that specific character. But, yeah, uh, that's what you, you have to do. You have to become it. You know, like acting shouldn't be called acting because you're never you're never acting. You're being. It should be called being. You can't fake it anymore in front of the camera. On, on the theater, you can a little bit more, but in front of that camera, you know, you you have to be what's going on. Like if you're supposed to be angry, then you have to be angry. You can't act angry. You have to be pissed. So you totally nailed it. That's exactly what it's about. Well, you know what I did? I didn't, I didn't do any acting. Uh, then again, that could be any given day. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I actually did some screen testing work down in Los Angeles. I'm trying to remember oh, cool. the name of the, of the place, but I did have some roles. I had to read some copy and so on and so forth. That was my, that was my very first experience. And I don't wow. have, yeah. And, and I don't have the reels. Uh, so I said, you know, maybe video is not for me. Maybe I'll just stick to audio. Uh, and it had nothing to do with not being video, um, centric. It was just about saying, you know what? I've always been told I had a good voice. So then I went to school to do it. Uh, and then I enhanced my internal structure of, of learning how to write better and just become better doing what I do. So, uh, I'm looking for a TV spot. If there is one talking sports like Cowherd has or, or oh, what nice. have you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested in that. Uh, a, a, a constituent of mine, I, you probably know him, Rob Fukuzaki on Channel 7. Oh, yeah, I know who he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I met Rob a couple times. Matter of fact, I followed him on social media, and the next day I go to Disneyland. It was the same day that Peyton Manning was on the uh, horse, I don't know, horse trailer. It's not a horse trailer, but it's a carriage drawn by horses. So it, it's oh, yes, carriage. yes, yes, so, yes. So he's going down Main Street, and, and I'm walking down the opposite direction. Uh, I kind of waved to him and said hello and what's happening. So anyway, I'm walking down the way, and there's Rob Fukuzaki on the right-hand side in like a little nook and corner area. So, hey, Rob, what's going on? You know, how are you? He says, I'm sorry, do I know you? I said, uh, <laughs> we follow each other on Twitter. He said, oh, 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 yeah, okay, okay, yeah, that's it. I'm like, look, dude, this guy has thousands of people on social yeah. media who follow him, and in, he like, he, I, I assume he knows who right. I was, and he wasn't right. anyway. So, bottom line is, is Rob's Rob's a great guy. He does his TV thing. So I thought yeah. to myself, man, this could work. You know, if if Rob Fukuzaki, totally who's it. very photogenic, thank you, thank you, by the way. So he's have very you, photogenic. Have you, have you contacted ESPN? Uh, I, you know what's funny about ESPN is that I had applied for an analyst position at ESPN, uh, and I and I applied. So okay, mm -hmm. fine. So they sent back this test. So I took the test. And the test oh, cool. was, well, yeah, it would have sports. been. They asked a bunch of sports questions, right? Yeah, well, sports questions are, I don't know. They're just sports questions. But 
the the problem was is that I failed the test, obviously. Otherwise, I'd probably – well, I don't know. They did a bunch of layoffs, and they still do. But um, I, I could have had a job at one time. I failed mm-hmm. the test. They replied back, and they said, uh, well, no, you didn't You know, get – they didn't explain the process. They didn't say what you got wrong. They just autonomously said, uh, well, thanks a lot for replying. Didn't right. tell me what I – I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. So if I get the spot at ESPN at some other point, then – so be it. Uh, you know, it is It is what it is. But uh, I, I want to introduce a, a gentleman who does something a little bit different. He just entered the Rude Dog Show premises. Uh, of course, the dogs are barking, uh, and I'm not referring to my feet. But uh, <laughs> welcome to the show. Uh, a, a good friend of mine who does great podcasts like the one he did uh, with another friend of mine in, in the Mitchell Report, and he's in Canada. So shout out to Rory Mitchell of the Mitchell Report. He's from he lives in Canada still. So, oh. yeah. So, anyway, welcome to the show, Tucker Dale Blue Tucker. How you doing, Rudy? Pleasure to be back on the Rude Dog Show. What, what? How you guys doing? What's going on? I'm doing great. This is Kelsa Kinsley. She is uh, originally from Canada. There's a reference. Uh, she's yeah. here trying to get her acting career up and running. She's done some interesting things from being on Howard Stern to the Weather Channel, which you couldn't get any more polar opposite than that. Right. If you were a polar bear that was looking for snow to sleep in. Or uh, Howard <laughs> likes to make it rain. I mean, I'm sure there's some kind of way we can make it about weather. But, you know, <laughs> Kelsa, um, what's up? What's up? How you doing? Hey, I'm doing – whereabouts in Canada are you? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not in Canada, but he was saying I was just jumping in on uh, Rory's Mitchell Report, the Mitchell Report oh, podcast, right, which yeah, is out of Canada that. too. So it's been a Canadian week. For us LA guys this week, I'm out of Redondo. I'm South Bay, but cool. yeah, I'm in the Valley. Right on, right on, <laughs> Valley sister. She's well, welcome, a, a Valley girl uh, uh, officially <laughs> here yeah. on the show. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna welcome in our our, our next guest. But uh, Kelsa, thank you so much for coming on the show. If, if I hear back from that exec, I will let you know because it's kind of a big deal uh, if he wants to contact. Me and I'm sure, uh, and I'm sure he can contact you as well. So tell everybody that where they can be. find you, where they can see your trailers. I know it's Kelsey Kinsley without an e. dot right. com, but yeah. where else no. can they find you on social media? Um, you can just go to oh, I'm, I'm on social media everywhere. I mean, Instagram, everything is just Kelsey Kinsley, no e and Kinsley. You can go to IMDb as well. And um, I really appreciate you having me on the show. You have a great show. You keep on keeping on, my friend. Keep. Rock it. Everybody <laughs> loves the Rude Dog Show. <laughs> woo, woo. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelsa. And okay, one last quote is, always have a plan. This is your quote, by the way. Uh-huh. Always have a plan, but don't be so stupid to think you have to stick to it. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like right. that. I like Amen. that because things change, right? Things happen. Right. Things evolve. They become better. Sometimes, well, they can become worse. But it's not those times. It's how you handle them. That's right. Exactly. And even Oprah says, you're always entitled to change your mind. <laughs> it, 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 that sounds more like a, like a woman thing, like the well, prerogative. Sure. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I think everybody does. I don't think yes. it's – Oprah said, said it, it's got to be true. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. Yeah, the Oprah Network. Anyway, Kelsa, thank you so much. We'll have you on again. Uh, love having you on. You've been, you've been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, honey. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Thanks. <laughs> Boy, Rudy, it's just a veritable who's who on the Rude Dog Show today. I always feel like I'm supposed to be the super special guest, and you've had about three people on today that are from all different walks of life. You had a, a Super Bowl champion punter from the Pittsburgh Steelers on here? Yeah. No, he's he's actually going to call in. Uh, Craig Colquitt is going to call in, a uh, father of – the other cold quits that are in the right. NFL. So he, he's, he's, and he's following me show. on Twitter now. Thanks to the Root Dog really? Show, dude. Well, hey, I've fantastic. Got Super what do you Bowl know? OG <laughs> NFL legends following me, man. <laughs> well, I thought Jim Everett was the only one who was going to follow me on there because I'm such a Rams lover. Ah, uh, you know, Jim Everett, that guy. I, you know, Jim, if you're listening, call him the show, man. I, I'd love to have we you. We love you, love, Jim. Love, I've been watching you since I was a little show. kid, man. <laughs> Tossing those TDs to Flipper, you know? <laughs> <laughs> whoever man you spread it all around anyway this is this is second segment of the rude dog show i did have another gentleman he was going to call in but uh didn't get a chance to do that maybe he will call in during the course of the show but uh the line is open for him to call in anyway tucker on the onset of the show 
we were talking about the NCAA sanctions. The yeah, Arizona I was reading about it. Rudy getting and... ready, man. I was reading about all this stuff. I what? mean, obviously, I caught wind of it, but I read up, up more. What about it, though? I mean, when, when, when you look at what's going on, highest paid position player, Arizona Wildcat system, being paid on the under the table situation. I mean, tell what's going on. Okay, I'm going to go back to it like you knew I wasn't. We got to just pay these gentlemen. We really do. These young men, I think it's time. Obviously, with these type of sanctions or whatever's coming next, these kind of punishments being handed down, this is more punitive stuff from the NCAA to try and protect their investment, not the players. The players are investing in themselves by playing on the team. They're investing in themselves by playing basketball or whatever sport they're playing. They're investing in themselves that they're going to move on to the pros and make the big money. But when we know it's a billion-dollar industry, Rudy, and these guys barely have enough stipend money to feed themselves properly when they're such large individuals, this is not right anymore. I mean, the guy from Arizona, you know, that was in all the hot water for this, he negotiated a $100,000 contract with one of the top five prospects in the country. Bro, the NCAA makes billions of dollars. A hundred grand doesn't even get this guy a condo out here in L.A. or, or even in Zona. I, I, we got to be reasonable here. I think we could factor in the education. I mean, I think that we laugh that, you know, these guys that are obviously trying to go pro are there for the education, but you could be. Some of them go back. I mean, I've seen examples of guys that finished and got their degree and figured out other ways to be marketable. But these big top prospects are obviously trying to make money in the pros. Mm -hmm. You're making billions of dollars off the men's NCAA and teaching them a lesson that somehow they're not worth a hundred grand to make you a billion dollars this year, Arizona. I, I don't understand that. It's just it doesn't add up. Okay, there there are two different sides to this coin. Yeah, the first side that says. This is the rule. This is where it's at. This is what it is. Being a part, and I don't even know how long this has been going on, probably the last 15 or 20 years. Other players are starting to be questioned. Some of them are opening their own mouth saying, yeah, I was paid a couple, you know, $45,000 or something like that to commit to go to a certain college. That ruins the parity in NCAA collegiate system because now you have teams that are becoming powerhouses because those guys are being paid more money like the young gentleman in Arizona to say, you know what, let's bring you to Arizona because we've stunk for a very long time. So now we're going to pay you $100,000. And I'm not saying he doesn't deserve it. What I am right. saying is that the rules that are in place right sure. now do not allow for payments like that to take place. Right. It's a pure violation. The problem is, is that basketball may not be the only sport in the NCAA system. And you, you're, I know you're going to ready to jump and chew on this one. Yep. That that's already happened. Yes. Whether it be in the football system, whether it be in hockey and that system, so you can get onto the NHL. I guarantee it's happened. Every pro athlete from the old generation, Rudy, from the old school, if you will, all these old school guys that I meet or that I hear on different interviews or read about, they always say the same thing. It's always been going on. They always say that. And what they mean is under the table, this and that. And you know, if you're big enough prospect, they'll get your mama house. They'll get you a car. They'll right. they'll figure out a way to keep money and cash in your wallet so you can go out and take your friends out to party or whatever. Mm -hmm. they'll, they, they know how to find you escorts like Louisville or whatever. I mean, this is part of what college culture enables because, again, they're making billions of dollars off these kids. They got to keep them there. If they start realizing like, like LeVar Ball that you can get your kids professional contracts in other countries right now, then suddenly that takes a humongous financial hit to the university, bud. Yeah. So they don't want the LeVar Ball method to be considered normal. <laughs> you know, I remember like Brandon Jennings or whatever, when that was like a big deal that he yeah. went over to Greece. Right. And now that's like normal strategy for, for people if they don't want to go to college. Because, again, they're starting to realize, I can go home my skills overseas. I don't mm -hmm. need to make an institution money like that. Right. Why, doesn't I, why don't I make it? money for an institution that also gives me money. Yeah. You and, know? And, and again, we're, we're going to circle back around this, but welcome to the show. A very special guest. Uh, first time on the Root Dog Show, Craig Colquitt. Craig, how are you? Pittsburgh Steelers. Whoop, whoop. Well, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity. No problem. Thanks for coming on. And, and I know that me and your PR agent were – uh, discussing this, she had even called me, you know, just to kind of say hello and how's everything. And 
<laughs> are you ready for Clay Colquitt to come on the show? So I said, you know, I think I'm ready. I'm kind of born ready for this. I, I've interviewed a lot of players, Craig, Jerome Bettis, uh, Jeff Reed, um, Vince Williams, to name a, a, a very limited few, Ryan Chazier, which I obviously you had heard about him trying to make a comeback, uh, probably one of the best stories in, in the NFL, if that will even happen. But, Craig, when I – now, obviously, you, you do have, uh, you know, you have family that happen to play in the NFL who have an equally as good a leg as you had. Talk about a leg up uh, <laughs> in the NFL – uh, but you won two Super Bowl rings with the Steelers, and when I think about the, I mean, the, you 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 played with so many greats. There's so many players, and these guys, I mean, ranging from guys like Mean Joe Green to uh, Jack Lambert and Terry Bradshaw, and there's a, wow, I'm just kind of miffed talking about because these guys are some of my favorites. Some I've had the pleasure of interviewing, some I have not. But Craig, uh, in 78 and 79, even though you spent one season with the Colts and you obviously the, the majority of your career was with the Steelers. What was it about your time with the Colts that may have been a little bit different than seven seasons with the Steelers winning two Super Bowls? Well, it was kind of, it was kind of in and out. Uh, It's really kind of a hard situation to describe. I, I was out of the league for a year and wanted to, you know, just give a shot again. And, you know, in hindsight, I'm able to tell my sons, uh, it's not about an aging thing if you take care of yourself because I was, uh, I had kicking cams for 13 years and up until I was 52. And I was still punting as well as I did when I was 32. So it's just a, wow. it's a frame for a kicker, for a punter, it's a frame of mind, you know, unless you have a lot of injuries. Wow. That's amazing. Hey, Craig, this is Tucker. Uh, I, thanks for following me on Twitter, bud. I just wanted to kick in and say, I've always been a big fan of the punter and the kicking game as far as pro football goes, because I feel like it's an underrated position, but you guys have such an important job on the team, you know, like they don't always get as much attention from the media or during the telecast. But then again, if a punter misses in an important moment or a field goal kicker misses, you know, at the end of the game or whatever, it's such a huge, huge deal. Uh, Describe the pressure of being a kicker, especially for a Super Bowl champion team like the Steelers and, and what that felt like to maybe not be the most focused on, but definitely have some of the most pressure anybody on the team. Yeah, you know, it's funny. That's it's a good question because early in my career, um, I wasn't married the first couple of years. And when I went to Pittsburgh, I was really pleasantly surprised how laid back the players were. It was kind of a a mindset. They switched it on uh, during the game, and you really had a lot of fun during the week. But I walked into a locker room that was filled with confidence. And that makes it a lot different. I actually had people welcome me, you know, to Pittsburgh. And uh, I've always told my sons, I said, like you just said, Tucker, if if a punter's name's in the paper, it's probably not good. Right. (laughs) It's because you screwed up. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so I I was fortunate. You know, if if Terry Bradshaw wasn't throwing interceptions and, uh, and we weren't fumbling the ball, I probably punted a lot more. But. It, in the same token, you know, I'm ready to go out and punt and Terry throws a 60-yard touchdown pass or, you know, or, or break away uh, Franco Harris or Rocky Blyer. You know? So it, it was a great experience. It's really hard to put it in words. Well, you just said there are three names, so I'll ask the follow-up. What's it like playing with legends, man? I mean, you didn't just play with just any NFL player or any, you know, person from history. You played with bona fide Super Bowl champions, legends, names that are going to go down in the history books. What's that like? That I immediately thought what I told my sons when they got in the NFL. I said, everything in the locker room that can be worn or can be saved, get somebody's autograph on it. Because when you're 63, or when I first told them this when I was 53, I said, you're going to want to have this uh, photos or things around well uh, my sons took it to heart they buy jerseys they buy helmets they buy shoes and they get the autographs of the players on there so 
I've got some uh, memorabilia, but they've gone a direction beyond what I was thinking, but I'm glad they did. So that really sums it up. I look back, everybody's in their 20s and 30s. My sons are in their 30s. So we were really young, but it was an incredible experience. I found out what professionalism is, preparation is, and focus. Nice. You know, one of those things that, that both of your sons carry from you is the consistency to keep themselves athletically ready at all times. Britton plays for the Denver Broncos. Uh, Dustin uh, plays for the Kansas City Chiefs, my, my brother's favorite team, uh, and end up falling short, and the Steelers happened to own them. Uh, <laughs> the last no gloating about years. that. Really I, no, no, not around. at all. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but Craig, when, when, when you look at conversations between you and your sons, and they're, uh, obviously they have came to you in a variety of occasions saying, Dad, what do I do here? You know, how do I go about making – a better game than the one that I have right now. What is the number one piece of advice that you've given them over time? Uh, even a better uh, conversation, or a good conversation too. I've got a a uh, sign in my house. I got or, or a piece of paper uh, framed that says it's the process. And what I'm doing with myself now. I'm not. I'm not working now. Uh, we sold our businesses, and I'm reinventing myself it's kind of on my website uh, but in the process is the routine what what do you do to get where you want to be and Dustin and Britton if you watch them two hours before kickoff they do exactly the same thing every game away or at home to overcome the anxiousness, the nervousness, the butterflies. I was kind of a little bit of everywhere. I had a routine, but their routine is, I mean, I can video it and then put it on two different TVs, two different games, and it's the same thing because they've learned that routine, that process takes that anxiousness out and they can step out on the field and perform. Uh, they're still human, you know, but uh, they're, they're leagues ahead of me in the mental preparation. So as a, as a guitarist, I see that you've been reinventing yourself in ways that are musical as well, sir. Are you playing the guitar now? Is that one of the new things that you've got going well, for you? It's, it's funny. I saw your picture on your. Yeah. Uh, oh, I've been playing that. for 30 years, bud. It's my, it's one of my, it's my bread and butter. That's how I make my living besides begging Rudy for time on his podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so that's was that looks like an acoustic classic it's, it's classic. a classical yes i'm quite fond of the classical style i like the nylon strings i like the old school kind of yeah. folky sound i yeah, love a lot yeah, of that that's what i that's what i play I, it works really good with the blues and 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 let your ears last longer than <laughs> <laughs> that's right and your fingers yeah you know i i, I do i've met uh, i've actually developed a couple of songs and there's a gentleman that lives in my uh, town I live in and I'm east of Nashville so you walk drive down the street somebody's a producer or writer or whatever but this guy's been playing trombone and other instruments for uh, he's 72 I think and he's been playing since he was 10 and I sat down and jammed a little bit of his song that I'm working on he followed me on the trombone and I'm going man this is awesome so it's it's part of the reinvention it's uh, you know I played for a long time but just now because of having to raise the boys, having to work, I can focus on those things that make me feel alive. That's so. awesome. You, you focus on yourself and what makes you happy outside of playing in a a professional sport that you've you know practiced. You've you know your your stats are absolutely amazing. I mean, you punted for seventeen thousand seven hundred ninety five yards, longest is seventy four. It's amazing, but when you get into something in your older years where you're able to feel out what could be different. I mean, I'll give you, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. For over 30, almost 40 years, well, of course, minus the fact that I couldn't crawl or walk for the first one or two, uh, <laughs> uh, being able to get into broadcasting, reinventing myself, finding my passion, finding what I feel that I'm really good at. And so I've been able to, you know, go through the motions and say, you know what, this is all about reinvention. You know, four years into this, this is about reinvention for me. Um, 
so when I look at, you know, as I have kids, or most people have kids nowadays, of course, and when you're in your 40s, you probably do, or you don't. Uh, that's really optional, of course. But uh, when, you, when, when you look at your career, uh, playing from 78 uh, to 84, obviously you spent one year in Indianapolis, uh, playing in 97 games total, what is it like? I mean, does looking at your Super Bowl rings just throw you back in time? Or is it something that you look back to, well, that was me before? Uh, I, th- I, I live through it every day. I, uh, to answer that question, I, I function with or I'm part of the board of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So I, I go into high schools and elementary schools and, and able to talk to the kids and uh, show them the rings. And, you know, everybody's amazed. Uh you know, the, the Denver Bronco ring my son got with the Broncos is twice as big as my largest one. Wow. But it, it's still the effect. It lets me relive it because, you know, we're just, we're just children in big bodies. And we, when we finally get around to what we want to do and like to do, it, it makes a big difference. So I, I love the, the impact I can have on young people. Uh, it's through the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, I can – talk about uh, you know your yourself you know the, there's so many things going on in our schools now that are scary not to mention the shooting but just bullies and people uh young people on facebook and doing the wrong things on twitter and stuff so i you know the my voice is you know m- develop yourself outside of your body develop your mind because uh, you know, you get older and your knees start hurting, your ankles hurt. You can't, you don't look as good as you did, you know, when you're, when you're in teens and 20s and 30s. So I uh, hope I answered that question. I wanted to jump on the, the part about your faith, though, because I was going to ask about it and you kind of naturally led us to it. I mean, we're all three believers here. So, I mean, I know I'm speaking for Rudy here, too. Uh, talk more specifically about being someone who is a Christian and a Christian athlete that is able to use your, your faith uh, in your life and then like follow up a little bit with the kids too because I think that's so important what you're talking about I was just saying today with the gun control issue I got asked on another podcast they say what's the root of it you know what do we do and I said I don't think it's about banning guns or about more psychological profiling I think it's about working with all of us but especially our kids on narcissism and thinking that we're better than other people and kind of you know this society that seems to nurture that and I think you know people that believe believe in everyone being you know wonderful at heart and I think so I'm really grateful that there are believers out there in the pro sports world that are, that are doing stuff like this. So maybe follow up a little bit on that. Yeah, I, get, I appreciate you doing that. Uh, my, when I speak with kids or even adults, uh, you know, I tell them I'm the, I'm the prodigal son and I'm the prodigal old man because I'm unfortunately divorced and uh, prodigal son uh, went back into my faith, married, raised the boys in church and faith, but got into business and the business just took off. We did incredibly well, but left the spiritual part behind. And uh, and, and it affected my marriage. You know, uh, money can, is a double-edged sword. It, it can be good and creative or, or it can take you down. And, and I, uh, I'm a self uh, what do you call this? Uh, I impose my own problems. So now in my reinvention, I'm going, you know, the greatest thing a person can do is believe there's a God, believe that this is created, that uh, our opportunity to serve and love one another is huge. And, and, and I don't want to use the word guilt, but if we realize you know, we can go in the total self-destructive mode and have to come back up uh, out of a well, uh, or we can believe and suffer what we are normally going to suffer in life, but have faith and endure uh, the uh, the problems. For instance, my favorite verses, which I have on my website too, which is craigcolquitt.com, and that's not a commercial, but it is. Uh, is Philippians 4, 6 to 8. And I talk that when I talk those verses because Paul of Tarsus, 
what is it's phenomenal if you look at this guy was killing Christians, beating Christians up, throw them in prison, and all of a sudden God picks him to be the lead guy. That's not a mystery. That is a mystery, but that's how God works. And he's also one of the most documented Christian healers in history. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, 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 tell, I tell the young kids, the first thing Paul says is, don't be anxious. And he said that 2,000 years ago, no one at any minute is going to get crucified. I think he had a little more anxiousness than us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, 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 he definitely did. And to kind of segue into, because you have eight grandchildren and there's a lot more to come. And I couldn't even fathom having one uh, at my age, much less having eight and plus then some. But leading from faith and how that transitions into having your grandchildren, you were talking about how you love kids, you like working with them. Has your ability to send the message to the children that you've worked with in these environments in any way reflectant of what you tell your own grandchildren? Absolutely. The uh, part of my reinvention is I've uh, created my own book. It's a children's book called Jojo, What Happened to Your Hair? <laughs> so I'm, I'm a bald guy. Check it out. It's going to be on the market uh, May 22nd. Love the title. <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome. And, uh, you know, kids, and, and I've got Tony Dungy endorses the book, and uh, there's a whole story right there, Tony Dungy. Yes, he and, is. And then I have a, a, a children's psychologist in the Nashville area that looked at the book and endorsed it as well. So uh, that's – what. where was it going with that? Somebody paged me. I'm sorry, or tweeted me. Uh, the Joe Joe, what happened hair – is my gift to the kids. I was just reading something about, you know, the Bible says, leave something for your grandkids. Leave. It's talking about, in my mind, is their creativity. And that's the route I've gone. Music, art. My grandkids now are drawing, and four of them have taken up guitar. And they're under 11 years of that. Oh, I love hearing that. I'm a music teacher. Oh, I love hearing that. Yay! <laughs> oh, yeah, to sit down and watch them uh, jam, the 11-year-old can pick out in a God of Davida. That's wonderful. Oh, I love it. But, and wow. they like classic rock, no less. Yay! Yeah, yeah. In a yeah. God of Davida. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, well, that's, right. that's that sounds more like Elvis. Theory. Yeah. You know, the, the, the best thing we can do for ourselves is, is serve other people. Yeah, there's the gift and uh, what's uplifting. Mm -hmm. You know, you down in the dumps, go take care of somebody. It'll change everything. Yeah, not so only that, that amen. Not, not only that, Craig, but when you look at the types of health that may not be in a physical format, for example, for the last four years, and that's almost as a tradition before draft time, I bring players on that otherwise wouldn't have a voice to talk to anybody. Nobody knows who they are. They're from the small division two universities and basically the underdogs. Nobody's really talking about. Of course, you have your Todd McShays and how these guys are in your top 10. And look, I take nothing away from any professional athlete that has put the time in in a collegiate system. But there's something to be said for those underdogs. I am one of them to help other underdogs become the overdog. You have the over and the under. They're the underdog because nobody gives them any time of day, but they're the overdog when they make it. So now they're in the next level, and I've been giving back to them for years because they, they most of them, 99% of them deserve a shot in the next level in the NFL. The reality is, is that they don't necessarily get that. So you have the CFL, you have the NFL, you have the AFL, the IFL, whatever FL there is in addition Vince to that. Vince McMahon's upcoming XFL yeah, part the, the, two. The, the XFL, yeah, that, that, that takes on a whole other uh, uh, genre. Which kind of, uh, it segues right into the next uh, subject, Craig, because concussions are on the rise. They have been, I've been approached, matter of fact, I was approached today by a gentleman who owns a patent on this. It almost looks, if you look at it from a different view, it looks like what's inside of a grapefruit. Um, because that's what your brain looks like when you don't have the right protection. Of course, there is no right protection, consistent hits to the brain causes CTE, and I've had guys like Chuck Yacobi, former Stealer on the show, um, former Falcons um, ex-wife, 
she was on the show because well, of and departure. Jonathan Martin just popping up again, you know, as a result of bullying and potential CTE doing crazy stuff. I mean, it's it's in the news again, man. Yeah, and it's on the horizon. I mean, what would be your message to people out there that are unnecessarily posting things that are of a negative nature about bullying and or uh, guns? What's uh, what's my reaction to uh, rephrase that? I got that, I got caught in the concussion. Thing. Well, <laughs> well, 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 well. Concussions are also being more more exploited, but in a positive way. So you go from having concussions being exposed yeah. and yeah. discussed in one certain manner, whereas you have bullying that's also being discussed in more of an, a too openly manner with showing guns with NFL players posting them and things of that nature. What is your reaction to that? What are your thoughts about people that shouldn't be posting things that are? Yeah, uh, I, I, Twitter kind of, I've changed my direction on Twitter. When I first got into Twitter, uh, I started realizing I became an activist real quick. Yep. I didn't like what people were saying. You know, it was 50-50 a lot of times. Yep. And, and some of the and I'm conservative, so some of the liberal uh, thing was violent, and so was the conservative, but I re- all of a sudden, I'm realizing, boy, I'm getting caught up in this, so I stopped. You know, my new Twitter is sports, and how can I help you? So, but, uh, you know, there's real problems out there. I was fortunate. I was a little taller. I was athletic. I didn't have bullying, uh, but I remember people getting beat up all the time, but I just didn't see that happening so I don't, I don't know how you overcome a problem like that i couldn't imagine being an educator today a principal uh, what they go through but speaking uh, about the nfl i mean i'll just lob it back to you saying that you have conservative ideals and whatnot i mean could we ever consider possibly putting restrictions on nfl players having twitter accounts i mean i know that like you know these espn people are getting suspended for you know, saying inflammatory things. I mean, yeah. could, could we not put this requirement on football players as part of your professional job that you either play nice on Twitter or, you know, it can cost you your job or or just ban it all together? Like, while you're in the league, you don't have a page like that, you know? You have an official page for us, and that's that, or whatever, you know? Yeah, when you get, when you get politically active, uh, especially in sports, and this is my opinion, and because – one of the greatest jobs I think somebody could ever have is be a scout that goes out and scouts athletes, the college level, or high school. I would rather do it the pro because they're already, you know, ready for that mentality, for ready for that competition. But I wish the celebration of our physical abilities didn't have to get into our opinions because we're all learning. And what's a problem over here is not a problem over here, or it's a severe problem over there. So there's 350 million of us, whatever it is. We got 400 congressmen that can't figure it out. 100 senators can't either. So, yeah, I, I wish the contract said if you go on Twitter, if you go political, you're out. You're We're suspended for three games or something. You know, make it make yeah. it meaningful, right? You know. Yeah. Seriously, sure. why yeah. not? I, I I totally believe that. I just thought maybe you might agree with me. I don't know. Everybody else thinks I'm nuts. <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, I mean, I saw something that was against one of the conservative writers I saw from a player in the NFL, and it's uh, reading what this guy writes. It's totally common sense. It's almost it's biblical that he's getting attacked by a current player saying he doesn't even make any sense and i'm going wow that's just an attitude that you don't want to listen to somebody else i i just you said it earlier though you didn't see a lot of bullying back in your time and i think it's because back before we had consistent internet it was you know if you got bullied you got punched in the face you know, I mean, that was kind of the old way of handling stuff. You well, said, I t- some, I t- said you know, something to you someone, got you got this. popped. Now you, now you get the internet to hide behind. I mean, and there are psychological surveys that say you're far more likely to say things online than you would to somebody's face. You know, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think you there's know, a lot I to be said for that. Like, 
it's like gossip. You'll talk behind somebody's back before you talk in their face. But it, I'll, let me go back just to what I just said. But here's the reason I didn't see a lot of bullying, especially from me, is my social studies teacher was one of the football coaches, and he had a paddle that was seriously <laughs> four feet long, two before, with hose in it. He only had to hit me with that thing one time. It raised me off the ground. He would get accused for uh, public assault today. That's actually happening in our a, a school system close to my house where a principal just grabbed the student by the arm to be firm with him. And we may need to go back that. We definitely need to put the Bible back in the schools. I feel you, man. I feel you. A, yeah, we're com becoming a godless society. That doesn't work. You know, on, on top of that, it, it's really showing uh, across the country and the, un, the, the, the types of violences that, that we're looking at right now, and re regardless of what walk of life you're from, a bullet's a bullet and it'll kill you. It doesn't matter if you're wearing a Gucci jacket or you're wearing a pair of vans that were thrown down to you from generations before. So it, it doesn't really matter. These types of things are, are just completely unheard of. Even when I was a kid, things like this. You either took it out against fist in a physical action if you were provoked to do it with nobody else around to hear about it. And, and so uh, nowadays you get in a fist fight, people are recording it, it's being put on social media, you're either the bad guy or the good guy. So you leave it to the court of public opinion. I think that's a lot of, of, of reasoning why people, and to go back to your point, Tucker, about guns and gun control and things of that nature, it, it, it's all about our societal uh, thoughts in relation to uh, guns, period. And it's our approach as to who should have them, who shouldn't have them. You're going to tell somebody something who's 13 years old, don't do this, don't do that. The first response to them is, I'm going to do it anyway. Right. And the reason yeah. why is because they're not brought up. And, and, and to your point, uh, uh, Craig, when you talk about religious uh, upbringings and, and, and having some type of foundation other than the school foundation, other than the football foundation, or, or regardless of that, without God, all of these things are completely out of control, and there's nothing to, uh, to to cement change with because everybody thinks that they're going to go on their own way, do their own thing, and there's no form. You you leave it under somebody's will, and will alone is not going to get you there. The Lord talks about how uh, you have your free will, and He allows that and gives that to you. But he also helps you realize the repercussions by using your your will and your will alone. But Craig said it. I'm gonna say I'm gonna repeat what you said, Craig. You said it helps someone else out. And I'm paraphrasing, but you said if you're feeling down in the dumps, help someone else out. See how that makes you feel. And I gotta say it's it's, it's broader than that. I think by doing what guys like you were doing in your years after your professional career and your Super Bowl career is you're helping other people get a lease on life, which of course is going to enrich someone's soul and, you know, in virtual ways as well. I mean, it's just how it works. And I think, you know, to the one last point, and then we'll kick it back to you, you know, this idea of narcissism that we are seriously better than anyone else. It's, it's a, it's a fallacy. It's not real. But I think it's being, you know, propagated from a lot of places. And I think, you know, we have to once again, you know, as believers go out and show people that we are all human. We are all of the same human race. We love each other. One love kind of logic. And I think it sounds like you're out there doing that and working with the kids is so important. That is extremely important in this healing process that I think our nation and the world still needs to go through. So anyways, back to you on that. Yeah. Uh, Paul of Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, he said, faith hope and love the greatest of these are love and he also talks about being a light jesus talks about being a, being a light and the light is doesn't come out and grab you the light is available so it show you it's it gives you direction and that's where i come from i'm not pushing myself even though i have my own football card a picture of me with super bowl rings I have my Bible verse at the bottom, and I, I do go up to people and say, can I give you my business card? And they go, oh, not. Well, what is he doing? Is he Amway or is trying to sell me a car? <laughs> and, you know, and I'll laugh, and I'll say, no, this is who I am, and here's my rings, and I, here's my business, Philippians 4, 6 through 8. I just and I sign it. I say, just please keep it and read the verse. And it's amazing the uh, issues that come from that. I've yet to have somebody 
want to punch me in the face. It's always thank you and oh by the way. So it's a it's wonderful, great offer. man. That's, That's wonderful. fantastic. That is, and I think that if more players follow that type of logic, who can pick up something just like this from somebody who's a, you know a, a dual Super Bowl winner who has reinvented himself, now plays guitar and and does things to. Uh, to, to help others. And I think if somebody took a page out of your book, they would probably be a lot better served than utilizing their own concept uh, by just following the example alone. But, but the Lord set that example as well. He also, he, he, he built it. He put the footprint out there for us to follow. But because we, we use our own will, we don't follow his logic. We tend to make a lot more mistakes without it. I'll get, I got a great example of what you just said. I told my sons, don't try to recreate the wheel. It's already been created. Pick out punters out there, kickers, that that makes sense for you and work that. Uh, we play golf, and, and uh, Britton with the Browns is an exceptional golfer, but that's what he's done is punting and kicking and uh, is, you know, look at somebody else. Emulate what they've done. Don't stress yourself because the information's already out there. It's called the Bible. Or you can go on the internet and see great information out there. Tony Dungy uh, has got a great website. So there's so much information available. We could, uh, I would think through this compassion that we have for one another, we could, we could turn our school systems around you know, the, our business people get involved in the community. Uh, there's a lot of impact that can happen just by being alive. Yes, I, I, I couldn't agree more. We're kind of going to switch gears a little bit because I had, a while ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing probably one of Pittsburgh's uh, pride writers. And when I had heard about Bill Nunn Jr. passing away, Steeler Scout, and I'm sure you, you, you know him, you knew him very, very well. Uh, he, he passed away at the age of 89 back in 2014. And when I read, when I read about him and, and I read about the social change and the atmosphere and the climate and uh, what are your memories of Bill Nunn Jr.? And did you have elongated uh, conversations with him and if so, were you trying to pass the word of God's word through him at any point? Uh, now, Bill was the, uh, if I'm, I may be talking about his father, was actually the guy in charge of giving us our pink slips. He was called the, the sheik, I think. That, isn't that the right <laughs> word? The guy that has the great big sword. Yeah, <laughs> the axe dropper. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I avoided that when I left. I knew I was going to get cut, and I left the day before. I left on a Sunday that was coming Monday. <laughs> but uh, he was one of the uh, those guys that I could talk with that just relaxes everybody in the room. And Todd Haley, who was the offensive coordinator for the Steelers, who's now uh, moved to the Browns, he was my ball boy. And his dad – was the scout that drafted me in the in the third round of the Steelers. And that group of men was just so incredible. I think that's what endeared me to scouts in the first place is those guys have the, the patience and the temperament to uh, pick that player they want to come to their club and they bet their career on that person. So they're, they're, the way they handled themselves was good for me. You know, Chuck Noll was really like that, too. He was uh, very cold, and, I, and I'm, I don't mean cold. He was CEO. He was the guy that you wanted to perform for. He's, he was the dad. So all that whole nucleus of men at the Steelers was a godsend for me. You know, my personal habits weren't so good. That's why I use the word prodigal, but I'm, uh, I'm back now, and I can look at people like that, and that's when I get excited about telling my story, uh, like we're talking today. Man, it's so, been you know, a, it's been a church revival on a Saturday in Rudy's amen. backyard in Fullerton. <laughs> I love it. it. Ain't even Sunday yet either. <laughs> uh, I love it. You you were talking about Chuck Knoll, Craig, and I I, I wanted to interview Mr. Knoll uh, for years. I did. I unfortunately didn't have a chance to do it. 
when I heard the news of his passing, uh, like you and probably every other Steeler fan out there, their heart was broken because he was a pure architect, um, along with guys like Bill Nunn and um, Todd Haley. You know, everybody played a vital role along with, with the Rooneys to get players that they wanted, including yourself there. What was it about hearing about his uh, departure that, um, I don't know, may or may not have changed your outlook as to who he was? Because as you said, he was the, the CEO. He was the guy you wanted to perform for. What were your last words or conversation with uh, Chuck Knoll? Well, yeah, I was cut by the Steelers, uh, waved, whatever you want to, whatever word you want to use, fired is what it is. So I, I didn't leave uh, under good terms because of that. But uh, in what you're talking about now, I can tell my son, this is the greatest experience that you could possibly have. I don't know what percentage we are of the United States athlete men that can go into the NFL or professional sports that cherish these moments and these people. Uh, Chuck knows he drafted me third round. You know, they picked me third round. And I look at it now and I go, man, what a gift that was. And, and I wish I had, res don't get me wrong, I worked really hard, but I wish I had the same maturity then that I have now because those guys in my life uh, could have made a big difference if I had looked at it like I'm looking at it today and the way I've been able to look at it with my son. So uh, Chuck Noll, that whole group, uh, uh, were a godsend to my life, at, actually. I don't know, Craig. I think you got some magic fairy dust sprinkled on you, brother, because your kids seem to be doing pretty well. You all got chips. It's nuts. I mean, how many families get to have chips go from generation to generation? Legendary Super Bowl teams go from generation to generation. You know, what a gift, man. Seriously, I tell you what's I tell you what's exciting is Phil Fulmer is now the athletic director at the University of Tennessee, and he was Dustin and Britton's head coach when they were at Tennessee, and at a uh, Outback Bowl game, uh, Phil Fulmer over the intercom offered my son Dustin a full scholarship in the year 2024. Wow. <laughs> You're like the Manning family. You just, you just yeah, keep cranking so out gonna, NFL superstars, bud. Wow. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind that to Phil because I'm hoping he stays athletic for 10 <laughs> yeah. or 15 years. I'm sure he will. He's bionic, man. you gotta, you got to hold, hold true to that, Steve. you got to hold him to the fire. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rudy Reyes, joined by Tucker, Dale Booth, and a two-time Super Bowl winner, Craig Colquitt, right here on the Rude Dog Show. Craig, thank you so much. You have enlightened me, and I will forever remember this interview as probably one of my, one of my favorites uh, of all time. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. You much know. love, Craig. God bless you, bud. Wonderful stuff today. Hey, everybody, go to CraigColquitt.com. You can find him in a new Twitter mindset at craig colquitt uh he is on facebook at craig jojo colquitt uh and uh he's just he's a fantastic guy thank you so much craig i i really appreciate it well my next blog is new mindset i appreciate it Rudy. Absolutely. new mindset love it gotta remember that one thank you so much craig take care take care appreciate thank you it. now that was Got me th throwing me back in a in, in a time talking to Craig when he was referring to Chuck Knoll. We're talking about Bill Nunn. We were going. It just kind of threw me in a loop. And it's almost like a daze to be able to talk to a two-time Super Bowl. And winner. now you just got to talk to two-time Super Bowl of golf at the, the Alondra Public Links of Redondo winner <laughs> Tucker Booth. <laughs> so while while Craig is a segue from talking the Super Bowl and talking about the Lord, I mean. What happened there at Alondra? Tell me about it. I know you, you're you a golf a sewer, kind of like a condom sewer. I don't know. How you I, I don't know. I think it's more like golf a holic <laughs> because a holic would imply not a healthy of a problem or a challenge or some other synonym that's not necessarily a positive thing. Okay. Um, my son, I know we talk about him a lot, and I'm repping the shirt today. What's up, Max? First baseball I game of the that. season, Rudy. Nice. First baseball game. He's playing for the Braves this year. This is okay. the first time in history that a Cardinals 
rooting for the. Well, that's cool. I mean, How you know, there's a, there's a time, there's a season, yeah. as the Bible says. There's always for, a reason for, for the season. season. For everything there is. My tomahawk chop. Right. But as far as the mini champ, as we call him, yeah. is an amazing baseball more phenomenal at golf. Everybody that sees him, he's eight years old. He's the same. He swings lefty. Okay. So let's just start with the physical mechanics of this, folks. Left-handed. And he's always been dominant left, but he's pretty ambidextrous. But, I mean, he lines up left-handed with a driver. Mm -hmm. He pulls driver on every hole, bro. He lines up with a driver. He doesn't always hit it straight. He often Mm -hmm. starts minimum. Wow. When he hits it straight, it could be all the way up to the pin. He's he's a potential every time he swings. And Mm -hmm. the other day he played a – He's, you know, he's getting bogeys. He's, you know, he's not playing. He's not putting up big numbers. Mm-hmm. He can putt. He practice. Like we said, we went and stocked Tiger Woods at the Genesis Open a couple weeks ago. <laughs> you know, this kid cares enough about golf that he'll wake up at 5 a.m. on a Thursday morning to go see his hero, Tiger Woods, and, you know, and Rory McIlroy, you know, at, at the Genesis Open. Um, South, even the PGA Tour cameras at the yeah. Genesis Open – they, they zero in on this kid, and they make him the meme with Tiger Woods, and he's getting in all the shots. I mean, it's kind of just in the cards. So, you know, really when it comes to golf, I'm addicted because right when I started really getting into it, when he was – I needed an excuse to go to the park and work on my game. So, like, all the all the prizes, got the, like, fly. Uh-huh. And I got my son, and I gave him a club and started swinging wow. and the thing Fantastic. was he quickly surpassed me rudy i mean he just went psh, right by me <laughs> leaps and bounds and everybody that comes by that park when he's one two three years old they're like oh my gosh it's the next tiger woods oh my gosh it's the next tiger woods and i'm like no 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 the whole punk rock thing was he's just the first max booth That's yeah. The yeah first max booth but the first max booth obviously has a future in sports i mean i'm, I'm gonna say it right now i'm not just being one of the various sports dads that wants to like pedestal yeah every of Rudy. Rudy. I've, I, I've, I've been called that too. Rudy. That late for dinner. Rudy. <laughs> Every single coach. <laughs> tell uh, Put me in. They're, 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 they get their wet appetites every time they see this guy. Yeah. I mean, all of them, they go, you can't coach the body, but more importantly, he's got a great attitude. He doesn't get down on himself much. He processes things, even that frustrate him very quickly. Great teammate. Never, ever gets chippy or aggressive. Anything. And of course, in golf, the only opposition you really have is yourself. Yeah, which is my own worst enemy. My worst enemy in every sport. Yeah, right. Uh, me more. I mean, I would tennis when I'm chill. I'm tightened up at all, and it's usually when I start whiffing. On, yeah. On mess. Same with golf. But my son, he misses and just goes right up and chips the next one on, and puts it in for par. You know, he's one of these kids. He's just got it figured out, man. He's got the right attitude. So that's why I'm addicted to golf, man. Well, his his mindset seems to be that of I I don't care what issues I'm I'm facing. I don't care what type of horror I'm going to get out on my sport. I'm going to convert that energy. I'm going to convert that mentality, the attitude, the of going out there and absolute best. So to, uh, to your son, he seems like a total. Well, we're a sports Stud family. And... We're we're pretty good. I, I I'm gonna brag. My wife Charlotte, shout out, she deserved this one today, especially because we're talking sports. And I was thinking <laughs> about all the personal uh, kind of benchmarks we've reached lately. My wife in the last 365 days, Rudy, has dropped 55 pounds. Wow. Charlotte, congratulations. It looks amazing. That's... I did. wasn't like she was like like crazily out of control when she started, but she yeah. felt like she had some extra weight that was left over from the baby and stuff that right. kind of just lingered. Oh, good for her. Yeah, a commitment, and it was a bunch of stuff. She got a gym membership. Wow. She, 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 different exercise routines in the morning with her neighbor friend and mm-hmm. starting to get more consistent about that. Uh, she joined Weight Watchers. She felt like that was good. Ability there. Mm-hmm. She's already gotten a lifetime membership to Weight Watchers. Like, she's already graduated. Like nice. they all look at her and they're like, Oh my gosh, we wish we could be like Charlotte. So, I mean, <laughs> it's great. And now we're doing tennis. She was taking tennis lessons, Rudy. And my mom's played tennis. I've been in a family that's, yeah. and I love watching tennis. I mean, 
fan of the pros and the majors. Right, right, yeah. I'm always watching the majors. Of course. But um, I, I always – it's kind of like golf. I always felt a little intimidated by it. It seemed hard to tighten up whenever I you – know, Yeah, yeah. Um, but now I'm taking – getting better. My wife and I are able to now play together. Right. Uh, I played with my mom the other day who's really good, and she, she and I were able to play. My dad and I were playing. It's it's kind of getting the family together, which is cool. And now we're trying to find friends to start going out. We got some friends that have a, a membership at a club we can go play at and stuff. I, I went last on a, on a tennis court uh, only because my – there, uh, I'll be honest. It's, it's not – Face mode stuff on Instagram, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah. I was not as svelte. <laughs> Did I just call myself spelt? No, yes, no, you as, just said as, that. The, the key, as right, spelt. I right. was not. I, I have like thirty or forty since about five years. And what it was is, you know what it is? Start walking around the block. I know it sounds like the most dumbass logic, but by taking long walks around the block with the fam, long walks at the beach. That's right, that's like, like that's that the too. fitness conditioning. <laughs> Start with long walks. Right, you don't have to kill yourself. Then you get on the treadmill, and this was a personal trainer buddy who's jacked, bro. He's all jacked up, muscular. Wow. wow. I said, I don't want to be like you, maintaining, lifting, and yeah, that's, all that. yeah, I don't want to do that. That's that's. I don't need to do a thousand sit ups a day. You don't, you don't need to be. But I, I'm not like, comfortably, and right. I think we all know what uncomfortable is to us. Version of what uncomfortable means, right? right? Of course. You want to feel comfortable right. in your own clothes. You yeah. want to feel like you don't have to buy new clothes. Ones that you have don't fit. Right, that's the worst. Is when the stuff you felt comfortable in is no longer comfortable. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? it's not uncomfortable. So you can't wrap it around your waist. Let's but, be honest. But here. my wife just tried on a pair of old pants that she found, like when she's cleaning out the closet uh, from before she had lost the weight. Yeah, and I'm sorry, she. This is when she before she gained it, and then she found mm. them. She can comfortably fit in a size six after all these years, bro. Wow, this can be done. You know, my proof. I didn't kill her. Like she had to like. Yeah. It does right. require change and adjustment or whatever. But I, I think forty. I was actually thirty-nine, and so lower teeth on the side of my jaw that just had shatter on my way to work. I was chewing gum, and all of a sudden my teeth shattered inside the gum. I said the gum is not supposed to be crunchy, so <laughs> I pulled the gum out. I looked it in the rear view mirror. Oh my gosh! So now. I go to the doctor, go to the doctor, doctor gives you this good news, bad news. What do you want to hear first stuff? I'm like, come on, man. Stop with the cliches. Just tell me what it is. So he says, okay. He says, pull two. It's now. And then two more later. I said, what? So he showed me both. Oh, my gosh. So he pulled. His rule is not to spit. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, so I had to go back. Oh, bad. Shame on me. Smack my so I go back to the tennis and uh, the blood stopped and all that stuff. So then he says, well, you're going to have to change the diet. Well, there's no bread. I can't eat cookies or crackers. Is it because it hasn't healed yet. It hasn't healed. So my dietary means change. I start eating soup. And, and soup. I love some soup. And I was going to say, if, <laughs> if you soup. are a soup loving person and you are trying to commit to the soup, that's exactly what I got in on, on the treadmill. I moved to the to the leg, you know, machine and all that. And uh, all of a sudden, here I am. I got legs and all that stuff on my back. I was I was young. I'm like, I'm 40 years old and I look like this. Now I'm 44 going 45 and I look like this. Well, younger people, so, though, <laughs> younger people don't take it for granted because they feel like they can well, put yeah. themselves into shape in a yeah. weekend. And you may be able to physically look good in your jeans in a in weekend. That doesn't lead to fitness. That's just yes. about, you know, how you, aesthetically how you look. Right. And for a long time, that was more fit. Mm -hmm. Fitness is about getting on that track, grinding, even though you know it hurts. Yeah. Because when you get off, you better go out and not yeah. feel like it's just overdoing it yeah, or whatever. Exactly. Because you're going you're to go back into the next day in the gym and burn and so forth so when you're doing it like that food. it's great it's fuel it's yeah. wonderful yeah. you know but yeah. i think that oh and junk food you know people talk about junk food no one's ever going to give up junk food rudy no i mean these no. people out they here that do and of, of course we live in cali where there's actually a few crazy people that do oh uh, yeah of course. i'm always on the vegan air fry non <laughs> here we are the air fry 
uh, GMO, whatever. We're going to eat all of our, our toxic crap. You got to remember to keep doing. Again, you do not have to do push ups and sit ups. You weights, peeps. We're not talking that. I'm saying go take a walk. Yeah. Make it a mile. Yeah. If you live in a. See the neighbors, you see all. See them. Not in California. You have a gym. If you're somewhere your cold. Three feet of snow face on and yeah. go out and just take a vigorous walk anyway it's beautiful yeah yeah no it's, it's you know? definitely nice out here in southern california uh we're talking i can't believe we got into the whole fitness thing i mean it's not something that i that i try to avoid from a conversational standpoint i probably need to commit to it more so in a personal standpoint but anyway we'll leave that as it is. i want to circle back around for fitness which is still kind of sort of related i think it's more fitness of mind fitness of What's going to come out of your mouth the next time you get probed by the FBI and phone calls that are being tapped and taped? What are you going to say next? What has been the big? What has been the biggest issue here? I mean, Mark Cuban finds six hundred thousand dollars. He's running his mouth. I guess you can call that fitness, uh, fitness of the mouth. I guess. But what is it about these situations that seem to be parallel? Because I guarantee you that young kid will not get a shot at the NBA because of this whole fiasco being positioned as the point player here in Arizona. I know people are going to say that this is letting the people off the hook, the student athlete off the hook or, or, or the alleged victim off the hook with what I'm about to say. They're going to, they're going to think this when I say this, so I preface by saying it sounds like I'm letting them off the hook, but I'm not entirely. Okay. However, I will say this it's institutional victimization, Rudy. That's what it feels like to me. And I mean that the NCAA we already said earlier on, they've got a billion dollar industry going here. They've got to maintain a quality product, which is entertaining basketball and the, you know, the top caliber players, mm -hmm. they know they've only got them on loan. They know they're not going to be there for four years. Anybody good enough is one and done two and done. Right. If that, if that, they know that March madness makes buku bucks for their institutions all these advertisers that pour all this extra money and contracting into the schools, they need all that desperately. The LeVar Balls, as I said last hour, are starting to expose this in a bigger way than the Brandon Jennings did when he was like one of the few people who was willing to go at 18 years old and right. skip college and go to Europe and get a professional contract right. and spend a year making money, making a million dollars. He's not playing in the NBA, but I mean, that's European talent. It's pretty good. Right. Then you come back. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen if they keep pulling this crap, which is what the NCAA is surely doing with the FBI here. Even my wife, who's not that into sports, goes, oh, my gosh. I mean, I got a feel for the players here. I mean, this seems like such an obvious squeeze from the NCAA. And I'll go back to it. I'm not letting these kids off the hook entirely. LeVar is proving it. The Ball family, the big ball of brand is proving it can be done. Doesn't mean that it's great that you're over in Lithuania. It's not like these kids are necessarily going somewhere awesome. Right. But there's money there. You should be making money. Uh, anybody that's looking at this situation that doesn't think they should at least be paid $100,000, which is what Arizona got rung up for giving a top recruit, $100,000 compared to the billion dollars they're going to make off of him in the March Madness. I'm just saying, if you don't think you're worth that young basketball player, that's your own complacency. It's your own sheepishness. I think it's time to follow the ball's method. Go somewhere else. Get your back when you're eligible to jump in proof that you can be and come straight out of high school lebron james is too well the the the, the problem is this is that it's a ncaa you cannot pay players i don't know what made arizona believe that they can actually get away with it by paying this young man to to go to their college to be the uh, and, and literally the highest paid player on a roster where you're not supposed to players on but that's the parallel you said what's the me too what's the parallel me too. Oh, I've been assaulted. Me too. Well, I've been assaulted. Me too. Well, I've been assaulted. And over here they go, I've been paid. Me too. Well, I've been paid. Me too. It's like the old adage, Rudy. It, everybody knows that these guys are all getting money and that the bigger guys are getting more and, and they're getting hookups and they're getting hookers and they're getting this and that. Me too. I think that is truly the parallel, brother, is that every college institution, how many got named in that probe? It was like all the big ones, dude. North Carolina, Kansas, dude. Yeah. USC. All yeah. these big organizations, yeah. but Okay, well, them too. Yeah. I think that is truly the parallel. Right, right. And, 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 and to correlate and kind of wrap this in a nice little bow, um, or maybe some handcuffs for 
some people. I don't <laughs> 50 know. Fifty shades of NCAA, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the handcuffs could also look very different when your hands are are blood red from being squeezed too tightly. Uh, but <laughs> I guarantee you, things are going to go down. Changes will happen. A federal probe will investigate the NCAA. It's just a matter of time, and it's not a question of when. It's when it's going to happen that's going to affect and create this domino. Well, and you mentioned Cuban. Down. That's another parallel. Yeah. When's the next shoe going to drop in the NBA or NFL like Jerry Richardson with the Panthers and now it's Cuban and his organization's got all these sexual allegations? I mean, do they want to keep digging deeper? Because was it Leahy was on Speak for Yourself the other day and she's like, I mean, if they keep scratching at this, they're going to find way more because it's not like women don't know. Yeah that this yeah. stuff doesn't happen all the time and they mm -hmm. keep their mouth shut because they want to keep their job or whatever. Yeah. You want to play this game, boy, Mark Cuban's the tip of the iceberg. That's well, nothing. It, it, this is the entry point and a segue into something even deeper. Again, this, <laughs> this is an ugly look for, for basketball. All I didn't think it would come down to this, but the bottom line is, is that it has, and it continues to. And when you look at who's behind all of this, man, you either change the rules and allow kids to get paid, or you change the culture of the internal components in the NCAA to say, well, we need to change culture of the college system, the sports system. It needs an overhaul. I think it needs an overhaul. Well, this is a higher institution for learning, higher education. <laughs> and you're trying to teach these student athletes that thing. we make all this money and you don't even have enough money to have a car that works properly or enough money to feed yourself enough food. Because, I mean, I'm reading about these football guys that are 300 pounds. They get a little teeny stipend, a little teeny stipend to go out and eat. Yeah. You don't even give these guys enough money to eat properly. Yeah, and we make all right. this money. Yeah. That's what you're teaching them. This is an institution of higher learning. That's the message. It's, it's hypocrisy. It's indentured servitude, man. It's, it's, it's the old way, and I mean, like, historically old way <laughs> yeah. of, of well. treating – and I, I won't get any more, any more people are their own worst enemy. And so their actions are also their own worst enemy. I am certainly on that. I can't say I've made every possibly best decision on the planet that will give me a better leg up than somebody else. But I will say this, that from an institutional standpoint, such as the NCAA, the change has to happen. This is not the 1940s. This is 2018 NCAA. So if changes aren't made, things like this are going to happen a lot more often to even more colleges, if not all of them. And it's just going to be a black eye for the sport altogether. And I think that's something that now they've joined into the NFL in regards to going backlog and saying, well, now there's, you know, Ray Rice situation in an elevator hitting his wife, physically manhandling her and things and so forth. So I, I think they now join each other in that regard because I guarantee you things that are happening behind the scenes in the NBA with players that, A, they don't want to talk about, B, they're ashamed of, and they feel the same shame as some in the NFL who does the same exact thing. I think it's the age of transparency. You know, that's part of what the Internet and everybody having a video camera on your cell phone lends to this time in history but it's the age of transparency mm -hmm. like you said it's not the old way of doing things anymore mm -hmm. you can't get away with sexual assault or harassment in the workplace you can't get away with being a guy that assaults a woman and if you've got enough money and influence that that can just disappear from the media or whatnot right um that's not happening anymore mm -hmm. i also think that that's a great thing but it's also going to blow the lid off the old way of doing business and that's where i'm going is that the old way of doing business is the ncaa has all the power Rudy, mm -hmm. and if they don't have it, they call the FBI. That's the old way of doing business. <laughs> and it's still happening. And it reminds me of net neutrality or something if we just use yeah. another parallel. Right. My wife was going, you know, I wonder about net neutrality, and I wonder what so-and-so thinks about net neutrality this morning. And I went, you know, I was just having this epiphany about net neutrality. This last-ditch effort, and I'm okay, I'm wearing my, my outlook on this one on my sleeve. <laughs> this last-ditch effort by this administration to try and regulate the Internet just shows how old and idiotic these people are, man. It really does. To think that you can beat the internet. <laughs> Dude, the internet is 25 steps ahead of these old clowns all the time. Hackers, anonymous, all yeah. these people. Mm -hmm. They are not going to take this lying down. No. If they thought that they were, 
that's because they're idiotic, dude. That's the only reason that you could possibly justify this. Yeah. All this is doing is appeasing old rich people yeah. by going, oh, no, 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 we'll try and squeeze it one more time just for everybody's pockets. It's not going to work. If no. I know one thing, the internet will battle back. You are not going to win. Well, the, the internet will end up winning. And speaking of winning, we've won here on the show. This is a record breaker two hours here on the Rude Dog Show. I dun, broke dun, my own dun, record. Dun, dun, I know. Where's dun, my, where's dun, my uh, dun, 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 run, run across the beach uh, mode like Sylvester Stallone getting to the line, you know, that dun, kind dun, of dun, 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 dun. <laughs> The theme here, the theme. Anyway, look, got to wrap it up. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Rude Dog Show. I've had some fantastic people, Tuckerdale, in the studio. Um, I had Craig. I had Kelsey Kinsley. Um, that Look, you had Craig lovely Colquitt. actresses and Super Bowl champions, but you had me. <laughs> it's Dale different. It's studio. different. It's different with you, Tucker, than anybody else. I'll be honest with Yo, you. Yo, Rudy, and with I that, win. I won. I won again. I'm sorry. Oh, you can't. You're trying to beat me too. I won. I beat you to the no, winning. Man. I said winning, and that means me. <laughs> you won because you that said it first. Me. That's right. That's I said winning. Works. Here, <laughs> let's go to the judges. Was there this battle? This is Rudy Reyes on the Rude Dog Show. Tucker Dale Booth. Thank you to Craig Colquitt. Uh, thank you to Kelsey Kinsley, and it's just been a fantastic show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Shout out Twitter Periscope for riding with us. Thank you, guys. I see you all out there. Yeah, I did have somebody put up something that was kind of inflammatory, but we should end with it, okay? Yeah. What's the greatest part about dating a homeless person? Uh, they won't ask you to go back to their place? You can drop them off anywhere. That's all I got. I'm not going there. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have that one. This is Rudy Reyes on the Rude Dog Show. Tucker Dale Booth joins me here in the studio. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Church. Somebody really did put that up.